and we're going to begin recording. Um, and I want to welcome uh, everyone to um, choose uh, the selection of speaker view from the top um, right hand corner of your screen and that will allow you to really see Stephen and Marion um, if Marion speaks tonight um, and to also be able to see uh, the presentation that that Steve has put together for us. Um, I want to welcome each and every one of you to Hillel's annual Holocaust speaker um, and say that this year if it's even possible that we feel even more blessed um, to be able to bear witness uh, together. The story of um, Steve and his sister Marion and their whole family um, as they uh, experienced a miraculous survival story. Now, Steve and Marion were born in Amsterdam in 1938 and his parents, Ilsa and Carl, fled Germany, believing that Holland would be a safe haven for them. But with the invasion of the Nazis in 1940, the hope for a neutral Holland was shattered. And tonight, Steve is going to share his family story with us. Um, and we feel so, so grateful. Um, and I'm on a personal note, so grateful to call Steve my friend um, because I feel we've really become friends um, over these last few years um, of getting to know each other. I wanna thank um, a few other people tonight. Uh, of course, the Office of Religious and Spiritual Life, our campus partner, um, and the IAUJC, the Ithaca Area G United Jewish Community, who is our partner um, here this evening. Uh, and without further ado, I'm gonna pass um, the microphone over to Stephen. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you, Lauren. I just, since I'm not used to this, I just wanna say hello to my son, David, who just uh, chatted me, and he's watching from his summer home in Connecticut, far away from his home in New York City. So uh, he's doing his own survival far away from New York. Good evening, everybody. I see we, we have a long list of, uh, uh, of viewers, and uh, uh, I only see a few of you, but thank you for being here. The, li the, the list is long. This is also, although I used Zoom once before, for a family thing where uh, you, you can mess up as much as possible. Uh, this is my first uh, teaching uh, effort uh, with Zoom, so it may be a little bit clumsy, but uh, those, those are the times we live in. Uh, good evening, and we'll, st we'll, we'll start uh, right now. Uh, I'm assuming that most of you uh, hopefully have some background of the Holocaust, but normally, of t tonight, we're kind of uh, tight on time. Uh, we're trying to compress uh, over five years into uh, into 45 minutes, which I can't really do. Uh, so I'm skipping a lot of the historical background, uh, but suffice it to say that the Nazis did not invent anti-Semitism. It's 2000 years old. Uh, it was always prevalent in Europe. It's prevalent again. Uh, so the, the Hitler and the Nazis built on what was uh, what came with mother's milk uh, in in, uh, in Christian society. Uh, it was not something that the, the Nazis uh, invented. Uh, my sister and I, uh, you see, of Marion, uh, I have always called her, and now I, and I am the only one, uh, call her Zus, which is the Dutch diminutive for sister, for Zusia. So I was referred to as this. We, uh, we, we talk most every day and now uh, on the situation we, uh, we FaceTime every day. So it brings us closer uh, to, uh, together. Uh, my sister and I are arguably, uh, well, I would say definitely the last surviving twins uh, of Berg and Belsen. There were a few, uh, but survival for children uh, was just about impossible. Uh, I'll get into some of the numbers uh, later on. Uh, and we are arguably the only surviving twins of the Holocaust. We were uh, six and seven at the time we were take, taken away and we're 82 now. Uh, children younger than us uh, couldn't possibly survive uh, and children older than us are probably gone by now. Uh, there may be one, but this, uh, my, my best guess is that we're the last surviving twins. 
a, a little, just a little background. Uh, the Holocaust was not monolithic. Uh, it varied uh, from time and place. And uh, it, it was, the, the, the Nazism was an ideology. Uh, it was racism. Uh, and the and the fate of the Jews uh, had a lot to do with time and place. Uh, it had to do uh, it had a lot to do with the attitude of the Nazis towards the local population and the attitude of the local population towards their Jewish neighbors. I'll give you just two quick examples because I, I didn't want to watch watch the time. Uh, if you t if you t take the uh, Poland, for example, uh, the Nazi attitude towards the Poles was one of just of, of hatred. They saw them as what was called untermenschtum, subhumans, uh, fit only for slavery and ext extinction. extinction. Uh, and the attitude of, the, of most of the Poles, I mean, you, you can't help it generalizing, but the attitude of most of the Poles uh, towards the Jewish neighbors uh, was one of contempt. Uh, Yes, there were some helpers, uh, and, uh, and you take the same Holocaust at the same time, and uh, and as a result, by the way, 95% uh, of the Polish Jews died. Uh, you take the same Holocaust, and you go uh, west to Denmark, uh, and the attitude of the Nazis towards the Danes was very positive. They were the right kind of blonde, blue-eyed people, the Übermensch, the Aryan, uh, and the attitude of the Danes uh, to uh, Denmark not being a very religious country, while Poland is is very c uh, Catholic, and the Church did not have a very good record about the attitude uh, of the Jews throughout history. But in Denmark, not, not a particularly religious country, uh, the Nazis had a positive attitude towards the Danes, and the Danes had a a, a positive attitude towards the Jewish neighbors, uh, and all uh, and all but about fifty. Danes survived, and the Danes and the Swedes got together to get uh, all of the uh, Jews out of the country uh, over a period of two nights. So here you have the same Holocaust in Poland. Ne mm -hmm. all, nearly all the Jews uh, uh, were murdered, uh, and in Denmark, hardly any of them. Same Holocaust. So you can't generalize. Want to go to the? Uh, Want to go to the next slide? Mm -hmm. uh, up. Uh, people think of Holland as being the Holocaust, but in general, of those those fine Dutch people with their wooden shoes and their beautiful tulips and uh, uh, lovely country canals. But Holland uh, was the most dangerous country for Jews uh, during the Holocaust. Uh, it it for so, for some reason the the French finally fessed up uh, how badly they treated the Jews, and of course. Germany took a long time, uh, but c couldn't avoid fessing up the attitudes to Jews. But the the, ju the Dutch somehow maintained uh, a very questionable uh, reputation as being uh, one of the better countries uh, for Jews. When in, when in fact uh, the Holland had the highest death toll percentage-wise uh, of any of the Jewish uh, of any of the Western European. Uh, countries. You can see there was uh, there was a lot that was against escape or hiding. Uh, Holland was a very uh, small country, but this is a very small country, about twice the size of New Jersey. And you can see it uh, was at the time bordered by by Nazi Germany uh, on the east and occupied France and Belgium to the south and the uh, the hostile North Sea. Uh, towards the west, it's a flat country, no woods, so escape or hiding was extremely, uh, extremely difficult. Coming at the next slide, uh, one of the th things that people always grapple with the Holocaust is uh, it, it was the Nazi philosophy and the ideology that the Jews uh, were to disappear from the face of the earth wherever they could grab them, and, and this was codif codified. Uh, by the Nazis at the Banzai Conference on January 20th, 1942, that the Jews were to dis disappear, even though they started murdering Jews uh, in 1939, September 1, with the invasion of Poland. Uh, but the Jews were condemned without exception 
uh, the smallest baby, the oldest grandma, uh, you could not be smart enough or uh, rich enough or good looking enough or connected enough. The Jews were condemned. And the bottom line really is that the only reason that Western European Jews uh, who lived on the Nazi occupation, that any of them survived, that, that includes us, uh, my sister there, myself, and my parents who, uh, who, who are on the screen, the only really explanation is luck. Uh, but we all know that luck is something that is not equally distributed. It's better to be young than to be old. It's better to be healthy than sick. It's better to be good looking than not. It's, uh, it's better to be smart than to be stu stupid. And in the case of the Holocaust, there was uh, uh, knowing German was a plus. None of these, none of these things could save you necessarily, but they made, they often made a difference. Uh, so my parents uh, who were uh, a German, uh, German born, uh, my father was a, an executive at a, at a textile a firm, a large textile firm in, in Germany. My mother was the only uh, very beautiful daughter. And I, I say that because, because even her looks uh, uh, on various occasions made the difference uh, in, uh, in, in, I can't say necessarily saving our lives, uh, but in, in, in protecting us and also in, in being one of the only Jews uh, fleeing Germany were able uh, to take their property. Uh, and uh, so they were young, they were healthy, they were smart, uh, and they, would, they not only spoke German, they were German. Uh, my father, I, I once, when I was a teenager, I once, uh, <laughs> when I had one of my little spats with him, I, I, I once <laughs> said, if you weren't Jewish, you would, you would have been a Nazi. Uh, he was blonde, blue-eyed, uh, that didn't go over well, uh, but they, they had things going for them. Uh, again, it, it wouldn't necessarily save your life because the Jews were condemned, uh, uh, but, he, but luck made a difference. And, and again, I, I've heard it from other survivors, the only, the, the only real explanation for anyone under the Nazi occupation to any Jew uh, at some point was luck because it, it's a, it would have been a turn in the road, uh, a knock on the door, all, all sorts of things. Uh, you, you, you could not plan your survival unless you got out of Germany. In 1935, the, 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 uh, the, hit, the, the Nazis originally wanted to, the, their purpose was to get rid of the Jews, uh, which meant extrusion, just to, to get them out of Nazis, to, uh, out of Germany, uh, and to make Germany, and then later on in 1938, Austria, uh, Judenrein, free of Jews. Uh, killing all the Jews was a decision that wasn't that easy to make, it, and it, it really required war. Uh, so the, the, the focus of the Nazis was, was to get rid of the Jews, uh, meaning to get them out of Germany. Uh, the problems were, number one, they weren't allowed to take any of this stuff. They could leave with about uh, $10 in their pocket. Any property they had had to be left behind. Uh, an equally huge problem is that Nobody wanted the Jews. America didn't want Jews. Uh, we had the depression here and, uh, and anti-Semitism and suspicion of immigrants. You know, what, what else is new? Uh, Canada didn't want Jews. Uh, Australia didn't want Jews. Only South America, uh, you could buy your way in into some South American countries. But so, and, and, the, and the other thing was that the German Jews were highly assimilated. I mean, they were like me as a, as Someone once referred to me at a talk as a Jewish American. I said, to God, I said, I'm American. I'm Jewish, and I'm, and I'm, but I'm American. I'm not Jewish American. Uh, so uh, uh, the the German Jews saw themselves, and they were as Germans. They were highly assimilated. They, uh, they were very unlike the Eastern uh, Orthodox Jews with the payers and and highly religious. Uh, and many of them uh, had converted uh, in decades or centuries before because it was impossible to, to get anywhere being a Jew in, in Christian uh, Europe. Uh, so, uh, and, and the conclusion to that really is that the Holocaust had to be invented. 
which meant that it was it's very much like 9-11 on, on, of course, on a, a huge scale. Uh, but the, but uh, uh, I mean, now we know what happened, uh, but at the time, no one could envision that, that Germany, this you know, highly advanced, technologically advanced, the land of Beethoven and Goethe and Heine, whatever could possibly do such a thing. It was, the Holocaust was beyond imagination, uh, which explains that, that uh, uh, after the Jews were disenfranchised in Germany in 1935, about, uh, there were uh, about half a million Jews in Germany, a population of 60 million Germans, so a very small part of the population. Uh, but they were, they, were, they were disproportionately visible and they were disproportionately successful. So people thought Jews were all over the place when they in fact weren't. The, the, they were concentrated in the bigger city, Frankfurt, Berlin, a few, a few large uh, German cities. And most Germans had never even met a Jew. And during World War I, 100,000 Jews fought for the Kaiser and uh, 12,000 died for the Kaiser. So the German Jews you know, couldn't imagine what lay over the horizon. Uh, but then after 1935, Jews could no longer make a living. Uh, much of my family, or Mary and I, our family, uh, got, to, uh, got to the States uh, and some to pal Palestine. Uh, but my father was the most successful among them. And he, he wasn't going to walk away from it all because again, he could not look over the horizon. So my, uh, uh, his company transferred him to uh, Holland, the, uh, the, the, the neighboring country. Uh, and uh, because Holland was, was neutral during World War I, the assumption was that the Germans would respect Dutch neutrality uh, in a war that was going to come anyway. So uh, my parents uh, moved to Holland uh, and thought they were safe because that's what history told them. I, uh, my father went first to take over the Dutch office. I, I'm going to only tell you one because we we, we, we do have uh, uh, under a time thing. Um, my mother had these wonderful stories. She was a she was a very very elegant woman even even in her uh, later years and very sharp and and thoughtful, uh, but, but at, the, at this time, she was in her early 20s. She was young and she was very beautiful. Uh, and my, my father had been transferred and had gone to Holland, but my mother stayed behind because, uh, because my father actually had a, an official transfer to the company where he was an executive. So unlike other Jews trying to escape in the middle of the night, my father actually left Germany, quote unquote, legally, which meant they could take their stuff. And my mother told this wonderful story that uh, she stayed behind to pack uh, clothing and linens and stuff, but the Germans wanted to make sure that they weren't taking any valuables. So they sent a policeman uh, to uh, their flat in uh, Düsseldorf every day to, to, and here my mother was well in her 80s telling me the stories. And she, she said to me, I, she had a, a, a very heavy German accent for her whole life. She said, Stephen, I played him like such a fish. And I said, what do you mean, mom? I said, oh, I said, uh, the Herr Schmidt, whatever his name was, uh, would you like a butter brot, a sandwich, a tasse of coffee, would you like a, and, and of course she was young and beautiful and men, you know, men. Uh, and uh, so, so my mother said, uh, she, she just charmed him and, and said to me, and here she was in the 80s, I knew he wasn't looking at my packing. Uh, in the meantime, my mother was hiding the silverware and all sorts of things, which a lot of stuff we still have uh, in the linens. And so we, uh, um, uh, among our own very un unique journey, my parents were probably the, among the only ones who actually were able to rescue uh, not only their lives, but uh, uh, the, their, their personal uh, belongings. Can we skip to the next slide? Uh, so here, I'm sort of the, the family historian. And one other story, when, when my mother, again, so we're talking about luck, but some, some things, my mother was, was young and beautiful. And, and in, in those days, it didn't have credit cards and you couldn't take cash. When she finally left Germany uh, to, to go to Holland and be re reunited with, uh, with my, my father, 
uh, she t my parents had bought a lot of jewelry. Uh, and one piece, in fact, saved our life. Uh, a half hour story by itself. Uh, and she, she went to the train and she had on a, a red coat with black velvet lapels uh, and fishnet stuff, uh, stockings uh, and uh, makeup all over her face. And, and the lapels of her jacket were, were full of jewelry. And she, uh, I, I remember her exact uh, comment. She said, I, I looked like a 10 mark hooker. Uh, so nobody would believe that this jewelry was real, but it was real. Uh, and she was able to cross the border because she looked, she looked like a young tramp with a lot of cheap uh, wool with jewelry on it, but it was, it was all real. Uh, so my parents were reunited and, he, and this was just, uh, since, since I'm sort of the family historian, I, uh, my mother gave me all these pictures years and years ago. And I, uh, I, you know, I said to her, I said, Mom, why are you smiling? The world is about, uh, about to come apart. And, I, and she says, what do you mean? We were in Holland. Dad had a great job. Uh, she, uh, my sister and I came along in 1938. And she said life was wonderful because they, you know, they couldn't look over the horizon. And they, assume, they assumed uh, that Holland was safe. Can we go to the next slide? Thank you. Uh, and then came the shock of, of May 10th, uh, when uh, not out of the blue, out of the dark, the Germans bom bombed Holland, uh, Amsterdam, and especially Rotterdam. Uh, the neutrality that, uh, that, 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 that the Jews in Holland had taken for granted uh, was, a, was a fiction. Uh, there was no neutrality, uh, and by the way, the the uh, there were about 140,000 Jews in Holland uh, at that time. About uh, 30, about 30,000 of them uh, were refugees, like my parents. The relationship between the Dutch Jews and the Ge German Jews was not good, uh, as, as my mother told me that the Dutch Jews, uh, in their panic, blamed the German Jews. That, that had the German Jews not escaped across the border into Holland, Hitler wouldn't be chasing them into Holland. I mean, pure, pure nonsense, but that's the kind of panic. Uh, Holland was, uh, uh, the, the, was a very unusual occupation uh, and, and, that, and that worked to the, an awful disadvantage for the Jews. The, the, the Nazis knew everything because Holland is a very bureaucratic country. Uh, it's small. There were six days of resistance. The the uh, the queen fled to to London. Uh, it had the third largest Nazi movement in Europe. The largest, of course, was Germany, and the second uh, was uh, Austria, and the third was Holland. Ten percent of the vote went to the Dutch uh, Nazi Party. Uh, but more than that, the Nazis uh, viewed Holland very much like Austria, and they and they had there was an the intention to incorporate Holland into the Greater Reich the same way that, that Austria was uh, incorporated into the Nazi regime. Uh, so, th so they had a sort of a civil occupation. There were plenty of troops around, uh, but, the, but the Dutch bureaucracy, the banks, uh, the universities, uh, uh, the legislature, uh, the, so the academy, the, uh, uh, the banking system, all worked for the Nazis, maybe not willingly, but they did it uh, so that they knew that Charles Hess, my father had a, had a Ford and two bicycles. They knew where everybody lived. They knew where everybody's bank account was. So there was no secrecy because the entire Dutch bureaucracy, uh, they didn't like the Germans, but they, uh, the, Holland uh, being a trading nation had this philosophy of going along to get along. And, and what happened was that there were no, you couldn't hide uh, the people, you, you, you didn't know who you could trust. Uh, uh, so the civil occupation totally opened up uh, all the information about the Jews uh, in Holland. And I said there were about uh, 140,000 Jews uh, in Holland, including about 20 to 30,000 refugees, mostly from Germany, uh, some from France and, uh, uh, from, and, and from Poland. Uh, out of a population of nine million, uh, when the uh, can we can we move ahead? 
uh, that this was Zeus and me at the time. We've changed a bit, me, me more than my sister. Uh, we were just talking before about this. Uh, at, at, when, the, when the Germans came in, the Jews were increasingly uh, kept, uh, they, 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 they had a curfew, they could only, go, only shop at certain stores at certain hours. And they were they had to be inside, and my mother had two two small children. We were uh, those photographs were taken either in late 1942 or early 1943 before we were taken. Um, uh, my mother had a nanny for, for us, who a Dutch girl who had these Dutch costumes, uh, and uh, uh, since we were <laughs> sort of a pandemic, since all the Jews were confined to their homes, uh, the, the the nanny. Uh, had these costumes and thought it would be nice to bring them over and dress us in them. And my mother arranged for a photographer, Mr. Fisher, uh, to take his whole series of pictures that we still have. And uh, when my mother told me this story, uh, she said, oh, wait, there's more. There's always more. Uh, sometime after these photographs were taken and delivered, pre-digital, uh, the Nazis caught Mr. Fisher making uh, uh, false ID papers, ID papers for the Dutch resistance, and they shot him. Uh, so I will. So I make it a point to remember the death of 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 Mr. Fisher. Uh, we can uh, go on to the next slide. In the in the beginning of the uh, from the invasion from 1940 to 1942, uh, the Dutch were waiting for the Dutch Jews were waiting for the other shoe to drop. Uh, the Jews were not being deported uh, for the first two years, uh, and the and and the reason the reason was that the that the Nazis were busy killing off the Jews of Eastern Europe. Uh, the, their list of Jews numbered eleven million. They actually were uh, nine million because uh, the list included Jew, Jews of England and Scotland and and Ireland, countries that were never occupied, Sweden. In Switzerland, but there were, there were 11 million Jews in in, in Greater Europe, uh, but nine million of them uh, were under Nazi occupation. It took it it took the the Nazis two years to figure out industrialized murder. They started by shooting Jews in ditches or, and in at Babi Yar in 1941, uh, 39,000 Jews shot in 24 hours in ditches, uh, but they were the the Nazis consider that to be to be not uh, efficient and too hard on the on the kind souls of the of the Nazi soldiers that did the shooting. Uh, they weren't too concerned about Jewish babies who were the victims. Uh, so it took two years, two years, and by 1942, the killing process had been perfected to an industrial level, and they had capacity to start deporting and and killing the Jews of Western Europe. Again, the Jews were all condemned. And at that point, uh, uh, is it possible to go, go back to the map of Holland? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, that, that's, that's fine. Uh, up, uh, up in the top of your screen where it says Netherlands, you'll see a, a town called Kampen. And uh, in Kampen, you, you, you can forward back to the slide. Just remember Kampen. Uh, at, at Kampen, the Dutch Jewish community uh, built a uh, a refugee center for the Jews escaping from Germany. They didn't want to bother Jews, uh, but they, did, they didn't want them in Amsterdam either. So they basically built, uh, the, the Jews had to finance it, they built a, uh, a large facility uh, for the, what you would now call uh, uh, illegal uh, immigrants. Uh, so for this, the Nazis found very useful. It was right on the border of, uh, between Holland and Germany, and they started deporting uh, the Jews from Amsterdam and Rotterdam uh, and, and smaller towns uh, to Westerborg. Westerborg was a, uh, uh, a holding center. It was not a concentration camp. People were not being killed there. Uh, the, the living conditions were pretty bad. Uh, but they, they, the Jews, you know, to to the Nazis, they were just all Jews. But 
uh, the, they were the best and the brightest. They were famous conductors and physicians and and composers and 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 journalists and uh, there was a lot of talent there. And the Jews managed to 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 organize schools for the children and uh, and, and and they were wonderful musicians and they had uh, occasional concerts. Uh, so while it was an awful existence, it was not a concentration camp. Uh, but the horror of Westerborg was that was that every Tuesday, uh, trains, a train uh, left uh, uh, Westerborg. Here's a picture of Westerborg. I always think of it as a, as a, a, a cowboy town, very dusty, full of flies and uh, poor food, uh, you know, very primitive, like a shtetl. Uh, but again, they weren't killing people there. Uh, but uh, on Friday the, uh, of every, starting in 1942, the Nazis would instruct, the, the, the camp was run, not guarded by, but it was run by German Jews, which of course the Dutch Jews uh, resented bitterly. Uh, the reason being because the German Jews were there. Uh, so they, had, they were sort of the trustees. Uh, and the Nazis would, and for, uh, would, would, every week would, would give the, the prisoners who, who were in charge uh, the instructions that they wanted a thousand Jews for Tuesday's train or 1500, how, how many the trains could hold. And the, uh, the Jews themselves actually were at the typewriters uh, typing out the names of Jews to fill the train. And the, uh, the by the way, uh, Lauren, how am I doing on time? The, how, am I, how am I doing on time? 15 minutes. Um, okay. Okay. Well, I always lose track of time. Uh, so, so the the Germans didn't care whether it was Mrs. Goldschmidt uh, or Mr. Cohn or the Hesses. All they wanted was a thousand Jews for the Tuesday train, and they preferred families because it made the count go up much faster. If they picked the Hesses, they had four people for the train as opposed to a childless couple where they'd only have two or a single individual where they only have one. So families were ripe for the picking for, for, the, uh, for the trains. Was there corruption? Absolutely. Uh, would, they, would the people, the typewriters, put their own names down? Of course not. Did the Germans care? They, could, they didn't care at all because the train was always filled. And the following week, uh, the people who were at the typewriters the week before were selected by somebody else. So it was a perfect system of evil. The, the Nazis got their thousand people for the train, uh, and and uh, the, the 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 most desired wish uh, of the Jews in Westerborg was to stay in Westerborg. And for the uh, when they when they posted the list, and I I, I have our list with our names on it, uh, uh, was Friday when the lists were posted and the tears and the crying, and people helped people pack. Uh, and on Tuesday, uh, they want to go ahead and move ahead. Next slide. Uh, on Tuesday, uh, the, tr the train stood there uh, and went to these places that nobody knew, knew uh, what it was. Uh, the, the, these train counts are approximately, because the history books are not accurate, but they're close. They're within 5%. Uh, there were 19 trains with 35,000 people, uh, Jews from Holland who went to Sobibor. At the end of the war, 19 uh, Jews from Holland were still alive. There were about 68 trains with 55,000 Jews from Holland, from Westerbork, that went to Auschwitz. At the end of the war, about 1,000 Jews from Holland were still alive. Uh, there were seven trains uh, with 5,000 people that went to Theresienstadt in Czechoslovakia, but nearly all of them were eventually uh, moved to Auschwitz and perished. Uh, and there were about nine trains that went to Bergen-Belsen about, with about 4,000 people. Uh, and that was the only, only camp uh, where Jews and especially children could survive. Uh, all children under 16, uh, Jewish children, of course, arriving in Sobibor or Auschwitz, with a very few exceptions, medical experiments, uh, some were able to lie about their age, but very few exceptions, children under 15 who went to a center of Sobibor and Auschwitz uh, were gassed upon arrival with the what the, German, what, the, what the Nazis would say, 45 minutes door to door, from the door of the cattle car to the door 
of the gas chamber. Uh, and again, the, uh, the, the Teresian was mostly for older, was supposed to be a model camp for uh, German veterans from the First World War, but it was a facade. It was just a gateway to Auschwitz. Uh, uh, but Bergen-Belsen uh, was not a extermination camp. The difference between a concentration camp and an extermination, extermination camp was the use of poison gas. Uh, people died ju uh, just as readily in a concentration camp, and the numbers were horrific. The only difference was in a, uh, in a concentration camp, they died from disease, starvation, exposure, uh, and abuse, and some executions. Uh, so the dying process took longer. In, a, in an extermination camp, the, uh, they were, the, most of the Jews were selected and, and went to the gas chambers within an hour of their arrival. So of the 107,000 uh, Jews from Holland who were deported uh, through Westerwork to the to camps, fewer than 5,000, most of them from, from Bergen-Belsen, uh, survived the war, uh, but 800 of them were still in Westerwork, so they, they, they were really not in any danger unless the Nazis uh, could have decided to shoot them all, but they didn't. Uh, so uh, the survival rate uh, of those Jews uh, in Holland who were deported to the camps was less than 5%. And that includes uh, our family and and, just, and myself. Want to, uh, next slide, please. Uh, these were the actual cattle, cattle cars. This is Westerborg. This is the empty train standing there probably on the weekend or Monday. Uh, waiting for the, the cargo. Uh, the, the average trip to Auschwitz or Sobibor was five days, no food, no water, no toilet facilities. About 10% of the people died on the trains uh, because they were already weak, they were, they were old, they were sick. Uh, trains from Russia often, because the, the climate and they used open box cars, 100% of the people were dead when they arrived at the, uh, at the, at the extermination camps. But this, this was a train uh, that ran right through the middle of Westerborg. And the next slide, uh, this is a very pathetic, sad slide because this is the loading uh, on, a, on Tuesday of, of a train that uh, presumably, well, I, I don't know where it went, but it was if it was headed for Sobibor Auschwitz, all those children you see were dead four days later. Uh, Bergen-Belsen was only about a day away but that these these people again were these these Jews were in these trains, and you see you see the little girl in the back, you see the baby in the arms of of a, of a father to the to the right, uh, and again it, about ten percent of the, of those who were put on these cattle cars never made it alive to the extermination camp. The man in the foreground uh, is the Jewish police uh, who supervised the loading of the cars. Uh, Everybody wanted to live. Uh, I don't judge anybody from history. Everybody wanted to live, uh, and 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 even these people, the the, uh, uh, the Dutch police also perished. They were in the end. They were also deported. The 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 Jews were destined for annihilation, and no matter what you did, uh, you, you couldn't you you couldn't do much about it. You you were you were going to die, with very few exceptions. The next slide, please. Okay, we're gonna move to the slide. Did you, did, did you mute uh, Austin? He may have um, have some connectivity issues. Oh. Uh, let me, uh, I just requested uh, the ability to use his, um, his control, so give great. me. Well, if you can, we'll, we'll, we'll just wing it. Uh, um, I'll, I'll be able to, um, to move it forward in just one second. Okay. And you can imagine the only, uh, each, each, each train, each car, these were cattle cars, uh, had just one bucket for anywhere from 80 to 100, 100 people. Uh, so you can imagine the filth and... Uh, I mean, it was just be beyond belief, and uh, uh, but that was, oh, okay. So here, here, here you see 
uh, where the arrow is is Bergen-Belsen, and to the left of the arrow is Westerborg, and that, that was only about uh, a day's travel. Uh, and uh, so the that again luck in that case because uh, and by the way uh, I uh, neither my sister nor I know how why my father was able to get on the train to Bergen-Belsen. I have I have my theories. He could have bribed somebody, uh, but the fact that that nobody was going to volunteer for a train. And because uh, Bergen-Belsen was in Germany, my father, uh, my mother told me this, my father told my mother when the war is over, that's the way people were thinking, it'll be easier for us to go uh, get back to Holland. Uh, and nobody, and he didn't want to go, uh, you know, to Poland, to the Eastern Europe. Uh, it, it wasn't that he knew anything, uh, but it was just intuition or something. And he preferred to stay in Germany. Uh, but that in itself clearly uh, saved our lives, but it wasn't planned. It was just, it was just a bit of luck. And the fact that the, the trip was only, only a day uh, could well have saved uh, one of us because it was five days to get to Auschwitz. You can see it in Poland. There were six, there were six uh, uh, extermination camps. All of them were in Poland. And the, that trip took about five or six days. And again, about 10% of the people were dead by then. Can you advance the slide? Oh. Uh, thank you. Uh, Bergen-Belsen was, was a, a, a concentration camp. It was a large camp. It was founded rather late. Uh, it, in, in, in the beginning, it, it, it was chopped up with, uh, with uh, uh, several, there was a Russian camp, there was a Hungarian camp, and there's also, uh, there was a, uh, the star camp that we were in, uh, the, the, it was called in German uh, Sternlager star, and it was named because uh, the Jews uh, wore uh, the the Judenstern, the Jewish store in their clothing, as opposed to the the prison uniforms. And the star camp was intended for 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 Jews who had contacts overseas or who who were well to do or who were well known because they the Nazis thought that these Jews could be, could be exchanged or traded for equipment such as trucks and, or, or for, uh, for, for Germans who were uh, uh, in, uh, held in, in allied, uh, in allied uh, countries. Uh, Bergen-Belsen was survivable in the beginning, uh, uh, but then when the death marches came as the Russians uh, uh, pr uh, liberated Auschwitz and started moving west, and the Nazis to hide the evidence, which was impossible, had these uh, march with these dying prisoners uh, on foot through Germany. Uh, so in case the Germans said they didn't know what was going on, they knew plenty. Uh, this is Bergen-Belsen. The, the, uh, the, the climate there is comparable to Ithaca. Uh, it, was, it was fine in the summer. These, these huts, these barracks were unheated. Uh, uh, barbed wires separated the very various camp. The camp was surrounded by electrified uh, barbed wire and people committed suicide by running into the wire. Uh, and uh, you wanna go ahead for the next slide. Uh, keep in mind these, fo these photographs are taken after the war by the British. Uh, this, this was the interior of a barrack. Uh, there was no heat and it was freezing cold. Uh, people slept in uh, as best they could in, into uh, three bunk levels, uh, two people to a bunk. Uh, and because there was there was a little stove at the end, but there was no fuel, uh, the Jews would we would take a, 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 a the, 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 these beds were covered with lice, so the the the, the, uh, the ticking mattress people burned it for the heat and also to get rid of the lice. But then when the when the mattresses were all gone, they would take boards out of these bunks and then spread the boards so you could be supported. And then eventually you couldn't take any more boards out and you were sleeping basically uh, with boards spaced so far apart that the edge of the boards were just sticking into your ribs. In the morning, uh, every morning was a six o'clock appel or assembly. And if you were still alive, you had to stand in the winter and freezing cold uh, to be counted for several hours and uh, hundreds of, of, of Jews died just uh, at, up, at appel. About 50,000 Jews uh, died uh, in Bergen-Belsen. You want to move the slide along? Sorry, don't. 
uh, because of the people were so weak and and it was cold and there was no no way to bury the bodies uh, every morning when they dragged and for those of you who have trouble with these photographs, my apologies, but it, it is what it was. Uh, they, they dragged the bodies out of the barracks and they just put them, there were 10,000 when the, when the camp was freed, there were 10,000 unburied bodies in Bergen-Belsen. You can see the barracks in the background. Uh, the, the, these corpses are all naked because the, the, those who were still alive would grab whatever clothing. And my sister and I learned to count uh, on these bodies because they were all twisted up and we would sit there and try and figure out which arm belonged to which body. But for us, this was the most normal sight. Uh, of course, the worst thing were the lice. We were all covered with lice, which of course uh, caused the, was a major cause of the death toll of typhus and typhoid. Uh, and there was no medical care at all. Uh, again, these photographs were taken uh, after the war and you can see the, you see the two men uh, sitting on a log. Uh, those logs are toilets, but more interesting is to see the men walking there, that life became so animal-like that no one would, if, if you walk past two men doing their business on a log, you, you, you'd you be grossed out and, and you'd stare in horror, but no one even noticed because all humanity had disappeared. So the, 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 uh, my sister and I didn't, see toilet paper for a year and a half. They didn't, didn't know what a toothbrush was. Uh, my, my mother used to uh, put her finger, to take rainwater and brush her teeth with her finger. Uh, uh, so there were no bathrooms, again, there were no toilets. There was a sort of outhouses. Everything was covered with excrement, again, causing uh, uh, typhoid and all sorts of diseases. Go ahead. Um, I'm getting, uh, I'll be finished in two minutes. Uh, again, photograph taken after the war, after the British liberated Bergen-Belsen in April 15th, 1945, 13,000 additional uh, starving and dying Jews died after they were just two weeks to live. That's 13,000 after the camp was freed. And just look at this picture. These two women are just peeling a potato making a meal and they're totally uh, not even aware of the thousands of unburied bodies. And you see, you see a woman walking and somewhere in those bodies is Anne Frank and her sister Margot who died there in March of 1945. Uh, but the, uh, the camp was so bad that all the, all the British could do was to get out the people who were still alive and, and, and burn the place down. Do we, do we have any, I think we're, uh, the British finally just had to bulldoze uh, 50,000 bodies into into pits, and and they're all unidentified. They're just they're they're, they're now markers there. And the last photograph, uh, if you want to move, these are happier times. Uh, my sister and I arrived in America on January 1st, 1947. Uh, I still I, I still get teary when I think of it. But uh, my parents got us up on that very cold January morning to uh, pass the, uh, the Statue of Liberty. Uh, it had no meaning for us, but it, it had a lot of me meaning for our parents. Uh, we were nine at the time. Uh, and uh, uh, my sister who likes to do things right, organized the, uh, just that was her 80th birthday, right? Uh -huh. Yeah, our 80th, our 80th birthday, she organized a big yacht trip around Manhattan. And as, as we neared the Statue of Liberty, I said to my sister, let's, let's recreate uh, January 1st, 1947. I had gained a little weight, a little more gray hair, but uh, uh, these are better times. Uh, but please notice my email on the bottom. If we can't get through the questions, feel free to email me. I'll be happy to respond the same day. And now, uh, Lauren, over to you. You can't hear me. I can hear you, Steve. Um, thank you, oh, you Sam. So okay, I'm um, on time, right? Yes, um, and you know the the um, the questions that I think have been coming up for people um, are are going to um, even illustrate more of um, this incredible luck filled um, journey that you and your family had to survive. And the first question um, is 
did you and your twin sister, Marion, who were so lucky, um, is also here, uh, did you ever get separated? And how did you and your family find each other after this was all over? I'm gonna, let my, sister, I'm gonna let my sister answer it. I'll give her, go ahead, sis. You, well, I don't, I don't think we were ever actually separated, although even in the camp, um, my father was in a different part of the camp. We were all together with my mother. And then there was a, a men's camp. Um, actually, so, so we were pretty much together as much as you could be together in a concentration camp. Um, but this is a longer story than the time that we have when we were on the lost train, which is a whole other story, but the train that we were on that was finally after 13 days liberated by the Russians. Um, my father, we were separated under very dramatic conditions. And then when we got to Holland, because we had no passports or any kind of identity and the Dutch really didn't welcome German Jews back in their country, um, we were almost separated again because since my parents didn't really have an identity, there was a question of whether um, we were the children. And I think, Stephen, you were put, and Dad, I think they were at one point put on a list of people who had passed away. Um, so after the war, there was a lot of confusion. Yeah, my, um, my, so I, I think that's the answer to your question. My, my, actually, my sister probably saved my life because the barracks we were in were machine was machine gunned by Allied airplanes one day. Uh, and my sister had the wherewithal to push, drag, or urge me under a sink, which was cement. And, uh, and the machine gun bullets were coming. We didn't, we didn't know what was happening. I mean, we were too young. But, but my sister had the presence of mind to hide in a corner under a sink. Uh, so he, I am here today. Uh, what I forgot to, what my sister mentioned, because I was so uh, tied to the clock, was that we were, that, we, that the, at the end of the war in April uh, 9th to 11th, the, the Germans loaded uh, 6,000 surviving Jews on three trains. Uh, and we, 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 my parents assumed that we were going to be gassed, but 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 that time the gas chambers were, were out of operation. Uh, one, the, the trains were actually headed for Theresienstadt in Czechoslovakia. Uh, the, because the, the Nazis didn't want the Russians to find all these dying Jews. I mean, it, was a, it made no sense because you couldn't hide it. Uh, one train was freed by the Americans two days later. The, a second train actually reached the Reisenstadt and the train we were on with 2,000 dying Jews of whom 700 died on the train or shortly thereafter. Uh, this train was meandered through, through the German countryside. It was still wartime. Uh, for 13 days and 14 nights, uh, no uh, no food. I mean, I, I could I, we could spend an hour on that story. Uh, the train was constantly stopped because the the tracks were bombed and the train was being strafed. And, uh, and my father would crawl away to, into, into a, a farm field and find a potato. I mean, as I said, it would take me half an hour and I, just to tell you that story. But uh, after 30. 13 days the train ran into the Russians, but, but no one knew what, what had, had happened to this train and, and it became known as the lost transport. And if you're curious, uh, uh, you can Google it, the lost transport. A lot has been written about it. It was a film made about it. And uh, it finally ended up in a small German town called Trubitz, uh, but the place was uh, typhus, but it kept, kept killing people and uh, said about, <laughs> Out of the 2,000, about 700 people died either on the train. And every time the train stopped, they would throw the bodies out uh, or at times bury them next to the railroad tracks if they had time. Uh, but there's a, there's a, a cemetery in Turbots of, 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 of that train, uh, people who died in, in Turbots. Go ahead. Laura. Um, this person also asked, um, and this is for both of you, uh, a few people actually are asking, how did you go back to your house um, to get your belongings before you came to the United States? How, how did you get these photographs and how do you have some of these items? Um, well, well my, my, my parents uh, hid 
of most of our belongings. Uh, the, the, the Germans did not go after uh, in Holland after mixed marriages because they didn't want to uh, hassle with the church. Uh, the church was only interested in, in its flock, uh, but uh, so the Nazis did not bother uh, mixed marriages uh, again in order to vote. Uh, and, and my parents hid uh, the belongings, paintings, as you can't see them, but I have two beautiful paintings uh, on the wall, which from the uh, 19th century that survived. And uh, when we finally got back to Holland, um, my, uh, no one expected us to have survived. And it's interesting, my, my mother told us that uh, some of the fancy friends that my parents had didn't have our belongings anymore. They had sold it or they had traded it or stolen it. With some, ex I mean, the, the Dutch, they had the great hunger. The Dutch, you know, had, had certainly had issues. Uh, but but Stephen, the maid, Stephen? Yeah, go ahead. Um, well, but do tell the story of, you know, as soon as we were picked up, the moving company that came. Both. Yeah, which yeah. is an interesting story. Yeah, the, 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 the second that, that people were picked up, and, when, and again, because time is so short, I, I had to cut a lot of stuff out, but the second the Jews were taken, uh, the, the Germans had contracted with moving companies like Mayflower and United Van Lines to enter the apartments. But my parents had a lot of, not the furniture, but 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 uh, silverware and, and sort of hidden hidden with either Gentile friends, non-Jewish friends, or, or mixed marriages, uh, and a lot of stuff conveniently disappeared because no one expected anybody to have survived. But our my mother's, I, I don't know whether it was the nanny or the maid, uh, who my mother gave all the linens to, had every every piece beautifully uh, wrapped in paper with not a pillowcase missing. Uh, but 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 life was so bad after the war that my parents figured there was no there was no future for my sister and for me and uh, and applied to get to Holland. But unlike today, uh, the first thing you had to do you had to find a sponsor. You had to find somebody who would take financial responsibility for you. You you could not move to America unless somebody signed an affidavit that they would pay your expenses uh, and. Uh, uh, and so, and we had that, and uh, uh, the, the America still didn't want any refuge, any Jews, but uh, but we managed after uh, about a year and a half to get a visa to to come to, come to America, uh, which we did. Go ahead, Lorna. Thank you. And there's there is no rush um, at all. No, uh, yeah, I'm I, I'm fine. I mean. It, it, those of you who have to leave or pick up a pizza, uh, uh, <laughs> you're welcome to do it. But I can stay all I can stay all night. And then my sister's in her beautiful apartment in Chevy Chase, uh, <laughs> and Stu's in the background, right? right. Uh, uh, we um, we have a question asking. Um, you were just speaking about um, Holland, but given that your parents were German. Um, but you were born in Holland. What is your native language? Does it feel different to tell your? Oh, by the, oh, by the way, that you mentioned it when we when we finally after we, we were liberated and eventually got to Leipzig and eventually got to Amsterdam, uh, our whole family was put in a concentration camp, a Dutch concentration camp for Nazis for ten days. My father went bananas uh, uh, because we were because they they considered us Germans. Uh, the Dutch had the Dutch had no love for for the German Jews, uh, and so we uh, we ended up for ten days in a, uh, a D Dutch prison. And my father got a lawyer, and we were finally freed. Uh, but again, the uh, my our parents figured uh, I, I, if I have time, I'll tell one cute story. Uh, the the only thing of value, uh, the only commodities in Holland after the war were cigarettes nylon stockings and bicycle tires. That was the, of course, there were no credit cards and no one had money. Uh, and my, my, I mean, we, my sister and I owe our survival to our parents. I mean, on top of luck, we were lucky with our parents. Uh, the, the, uh, they, they were relentless in, in protecting us, even though the, the means of protecting us was very, very limited. Uh, they, they could have shot us or gassed us at any second, but 
if there was a, if there was a time to be able to protect us, they they always did. Uh, so even in 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 Holland, this was a funny story. Uh, my father was in his early forties, and uh, you know he he had been a very successful executive, and here he was in a, in his in 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 Holland with no with no pro, no prospects, uh, and the only commodities my father was very resourceful uh, were uh, cigarettes, especially Lucky Strike. I remember the white package with the the red circle on it, uh, bicycle tires, which the, the the Dutch still use bicycles widely to get around. Uh, and nylon stockings for some reason. Well, my father figured out, uh, that this is my father, that around Passover time, uh, for those of you who are not Jewish, and at Passover time, the Jews eat matzahs, unleavened bread. I, th I think Lord knows that. Knows that. Uh, uh, my father uh, realized that matzahs and cigarettes have one thing in common. Lauren, do you wanna guess? Can you hear me? Yes. Um, <laughs> taste bad? <laughs> uh, no, they're both light. Uh -huh. So my, they're, very, they're both cigarettes and matzahs are very light. So my father contacted his sister uh, in New York and, and, and told her to ship over a huge carton. I'm talking a big carton, the size of, you know, of a computer printer uh, of cigarettes. Uh, and mark them all matzahs for Passover. And I rem remember going to the, in those days you picked up your mail at the post office. Uh, also interesting, there was mail waiting for us for years after the concentration camp in the post offices, another long story. But anyway, I went with my father and his bicycle, and I, I used to love to just push the bicycle, it was much too big for me, uh, to pick up this big box of so-called matzahs. But of course, they had to go through customs. And so the customs man opened up this huge box of, of supposedly matzahs, but they went, they were lucky strikes. And he sort of, and the customs man sort of looked around, who was looking, took out one or two cartons of cigarettes and they were, they were worth a fortune of cigarette. A cigarette was worth probably three, $4. Uh, he took out two cartons of, of lucky strike cigarettes, put them on the counter, closed the box and gave them to my father. And that was the, and that was the uh, the currency, uh, but uh, we had never been to school. And you asked about language. Uh, my sister and I, in the concentration camp, uh, we thought we had invented our own language, but it turned out others had the same lang language. It was called hula flu, sort of like pig Latin. So if I were if if I were uh, wanted to tell you in our own private language, hula flu. Uh, I am giving a Zoom course. It would be I I am la flam, am ham la flam, give hevel fling a Zoom hum la flum course horse la force. Uh, and my sister was smiling, would would have understood that perfectly. But to our great disappointment, when we went back to the reunion of the Liber liberation of Bergen Belsen, there were other people on the four buses who said all the kids spoke who were still alive spoke hula flu. I thought it was unique, but our language was Dutch. But we were surrounded by German. Uh, and there was, you know, in the in the, in the barracks, my parents uh, spoke many languages: French, uh, German, uh, Dutch, uh, uh, and English. Uh, and the, and the only language that my sister and I really knew was Dutch. Uh, uh, but when we came to America, uh, unlike Press Two for for some other language, I'm not going to get into my <laughs> conservative habit here. Uh, there was only one on the keyboard and, 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 that, and, that, and, and that was, you, when you're in America, you speak English. And I remember we were here a short time, I mean, maybe a few months, whatever, and my parents, had a, my parents had a little family sit down. And I said, we're now Americans and we are gonna speak English, American. The problem was we didn't speak, we didn't, didn't know how, we had never gone to school and they put us in the third grade. But, but the interesting thing is after, after six months, neither my sister nor I ever spoke Dutch again. I, I, I know maybe half a dozen words. Uh, it, it, when I hear it, I sort of understand a lot of it somewhere, but I couldn't speak it. Do you, do, do, sis, do you, can you understand Dutch at all? Or no, I mean, I can, 
kind of understand it, but no, I, I don't know it very well. Yeah. First of all, I think we, we spoke to some degree more German because that was, I took some German literature courses when I went to college, but my father um, really did not want to come to America not knowing English. So mm -hmm. he took English lessons in Holland because he very, wanted very much when he came to this country to at least yeah. um, and my, know, make this English. Yeah, my father was in the bit, it was a very interesting life. My father was called by the British uh, for the, the the Nuremberg trials. There were many uh, sub-trials of, of, uh, of, uh, of Nazi doctors and capos and, and the British uh, asked my father to go come back to Germany uh, and they picked him up with a chauffeur and, a, and an officer, uh, and not a guard, an escort, I guess. And, he went to Germany to to uh, uh, to uh, give testimony at a trial of, uh, of a man called uh, Casimir, who was a capo. Capos were prisoners, but they were criminals and they were brutal, and they killed many many Jews. And uh, somewhere here in Steve, my office, Steve, here, Steve, yeah, you have ten questions. Maybe you should answer. Oh, oh, go, oh go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Lauren. Time always gets away from me. No, not at all. And actually, um, please take your time. We um, have perfect questions that I, um, okay, go ahead. build off of each other. Um, you can direct it at Marion or, or, or to me. Either. I, know, okay. I think um, uh, this one is about your parents. Um, and how did the appearance of your parents result in different treatment? And what, what do you... I'm talking about when you're saying different treatment um, that they got. Are you talking about my, my, our parents or? Parents. Or my grandparents? Uh, your parents. This person is asking, um, I think because you mentioned that your parents um, looked a certain way that they received a different treatment. Well, I think well, I'm going to interject here because um, we have a little bit of a difference um, of, a, of opinion. I don't um, have a <laughs> You know, clearly, if you were uh, middle class or upper middle class, if you were part of um, German society, um, if you had friends in high places, um, that really didn't guarantee anything. I mean, as many of those people died in Auschwitz and at some of the extermination camps, um, uh, then, you know, survived. And I, I really feel much more that um, it was totally miraculous um, and luck to a certain degree, but also I think it was a kind of combination of being realistic, realizing the situation you were in, uh, and being strategic. Um, and doing the best um, to the degree that you had any power, which was almost non-existent. Um, so, um, you know, you can't really articulate those things, and it could have turned the other way. Um, but my parents, I mean, they did have some connections in Holland that may have uh, kept them uh, you know, at home later than being sent to Vesterborg. Um, to the degree that we were sent to Bergen-Belsen, I mean, actually, that's another story, which my brother still has some questions about, but, well, if I have two minutes. Um, so one of the questions, uh, as my parents passed away, that, you know, we keep on asking ourselves, how did we survive? How were we, quote, lucky enough to go back to Bergen-Belsen, where clearly many, many people died, but at any other camp, we would have died within 24 hours. Um, and two years ago, actually it was Yom Kippur, and I was getting ready to a breakfast, I got a call from the second in command at the Polish embassy in Washington, D.C. And um, I usually never answer calls unless I know who's at the other end, but I did pick this up. 
and he almost wouldn't let me hang up. He said, is your name Marion? Do you have a twin brother, Stephen? Were you born in Amsterdam? Were your parents Carl and Ilse? Um, were you in Bergen Belsen? Uh, were you on the lost train? It was almost unbelievable that someone at the other end knew my whole story. Um, and so of course I answered yes, yes, yes. And the story was that uh, it turned out that we had found, been found on a list that was really uncovered just two or three years ago, uh, which was a list of people who had fraudulent or counterfeit passports that actually were Paraguayan passports and Paraguay was neutral in uh, World War II. And so the story is that um, that there was a Polish consul in Bern, Switzerland, not, not the Polish embassy in exile that was in London, but this was in Bern. And there was someone there, there were only four really major people at this embassy, but there was someone, Konstantin Kondryki, who came from a prominent Polish family, and he, uh, with I think the knowledge of the person who was head of that council, bribed the Paraguayan legation in Switzerland for blank passports or a sheet of passports. And with those blank sheets, he, um, he yeah, I mean, he made counterfeit Paraguayan passports for help trying to help Jews uh, get out of harm's way. Um, nobody knows exactly how many passports he counterfeited. The first 400 went to the Warsaw Ghetto. And unfortunately, those people were first taken out of the ghetto and sent to a monastery in France where they thought they were liberated um, and of course counted their blessing at the last moment um, the Nazis became skeptical. I mean, first of all, these people didn't look like they came from South America. They didn't speak Spanish clearly and, and just, you know, kind of an arbitrary way after these people had been in Paris, in France, not in Paris, the outskirts, um, sent them all to Auschwitz and they were all, so that was the first 400. The next few hundred that he, counterfeited were mostly people from Belgium and Holland. Um, and by that time, there was a middleman. There were two prominent Jewish businessmen. And obviously, my father paid money for this um, visa. And so he was the middleman. So he would travel from Holland or Belgium to Bern and give the person a list. And, and got the passport. Now, we never really knew about this passport um, because the passport was sent to our house. And of course, we were not there anymore. But my father remembered receiving one, receiving it after the war to collect his mail. And um, the story is, and, and I do believe it because I've read enough about it, is that with these Paraguayan passports, um, you were considered a potential exchange prisoner so that you could be exchanged for Germans who were prisoners behind Allied lines. So to some degree, you know, you were a bargaining chip. And I think that that is the reason why we were sent to Bergen-Belsen, that we were potentially people who could be traded for um, Nazis, uh, Germans who had been caught behind. Okay. Austausch Juden. Yeah, so I'm sorry, that's a, that's a long answer, but it's an interesting story. It is, and it's amazing that Steve had the copy of the passport sitting. Well, you, uh, I, may, I may have to take a trip tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> that's um, right, yeah, if you have a copy. Steve um, and Marion, uh, someone is asking if you can um, Describe a daily schedule from when you were in the concentration camp. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll hand that over to you, Stephen. Well, uh, all the concentration, again, they, 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 were, they were extermination camps. There were six of them all in Poland. 
and the others were concentration camps. There were over 40,000 uh, concentration camps. Some, uh, you know, a, a small group of a dozen people working for BMW or whatever, but there were tens of thousands. But the major camps all operated similarly. Uh, you know, some had very high death rates, some had lo lower death rates, but they, they were similar. The, the, the day started uh, somewhere around six o'clock in the morning with appell, the German word for assembly. And here, <laughs> 82, take away six, uh, 76. 76 years later, I still remember a ditty uh, in German. And the ditty goes, uh, in case you want to sing it tonight, the uh, appell, appell, dann macht der Jude schnell, meaning assembly, assembly, the, use, the, the Jew hurries up. So with Appel, you had a, you had a, and of course, everybody was weakened with disease and lice. You had to get out of your wooden bunk, unless you were dead, uh, which a lot were, uh, and, 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 and come onto what was a, usually a very muddy football field type of a large uh, a plane and stand in line in rows of five so that they could be more easily counted. And this was torturous because if you, if you didn't, if you if you didn't have shoes, you were dead. People had no clothing. You know, I mean, uh, after two years, whatever you got is going to isn't going to be very serviceable. And and the Germans kept insisting on how many how many were dead, uh, how many were in what they would call a hospital or so a lazarette, uh, and how many were able to work. And and the, the, and they would repeat this because it was tough to do. People would sag and die right on the spot and they'd count them again. Uh, after, after that, uh, that, that, take, that could take a, a couple of hours and those who were fit, which is a relative word, let's just say those who were still standing, uh, went off to uh, what they was called Arbeitskommando, uh, a work group. Uh, my mother was in a Schuhschlappenkommando, which was a, a, an open tent and imagine an Ithaca winter uh, or at Rochester winter, and it was, and they would, there were mounds and mounds of shoes, uh, and they would recycle them by cutting. It was brutal work, but it's stinking shoes. Where they they might have come from the, some of the extermination camps, I don't know, uh, but their job was to cut the soles from the uppers, and uh, th th that that material was sent back to Germany for recycling to make whatever they made out of it. Uh, my, my father, the, the, the Nazis had a particular hatred for my father because he, he was blonde and blue eyed and German. You know, they couldn't, they, they had a stereotype idea of what a, a Jew should look like, you know, uh, uh, you know a, a, a crook nosed Jew. And my father had, didn't have a stereotype in him, uh, but he was useful because he spoke so many languages. And so they tended to make him the head of the work group and one day near the end of the war, which again, this is a story that could take half an hour. Marion knows more about it than I do, but uh, my father was the head of a work group uh, digging ditches and there were German guards that, that this, was, this was in April and March, 1945. There were, there were guards that would walk back and forth its long ditches, uh, uh, Nazi guards. And the second that the guard would pass where my father's group was digging ditches, my father would tell all his fellow prisoners, uh, you know, stop digging, stop digging, you know, t take a breather. And, and uh, he didn't see that a Nazi called, uh, guard was approaching and they caught him and they beat him. So they, 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 they threw him in a, uh, a septic tank full of, I'm, I'm gonna be polite, human excrement to clean out a filter. Uh, and they kept, and he kept trying to come up for air out of this, you know what, uh, and they would shove him back under and, and then it started beating him so severely that, and th 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 this is my father's memoir. And if you send me an email, I will be happy to send you a PDF of my father's memoir. Uh, he, he was beaten so badly that he begged to be shot. Uh, but what they, they dragged him back to the camp and he was unrec. My mother did not recognize him. He was so badly beaten. But my father had a had a a dignity about him. And dignity, it's it's just a word. But in the concentration camp, if you manage to 
to maintain your inner humanity and your inner pride, such as trying to keep yourself clean or trying to walk upright, uh, you know, that certain inner strength uh, that, that, that promoted survival. It, it didn't, it didn't uh, uh, guarantee anything. And my, my father had that, this inner strength, uh, and they dragged him to what passed for a hospital, but there was no hospital. It was just a, a charnel house where people who were dying were, were dragged to. And, and uh, he asked my sister to, to, uh, to she had a, the end of a tin can, which you know, was like a mirror. He, 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 was, he was very vain, actually. He was always, his shoes were always shine, and he gave me a hard time about my shoes. And he wanted to see how badly his face looked. And in, in the horrible condition that he was in, he had my sister hold his tin can as a Zatz mirror so he could shave with a dull razor blade. Uh, he just had this inner strength. And, 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 and I am positive that that, that certainly uh, in, increased his chance for survival. Well, I just want to um, add, you know, I remember Appel because that was really um, a very frightening daily ritual because, first of all, you had to stand there. And of course, we were young and, you know, in the freezing cold. And the most important thing is that uh, you did nothing that would call attention to you. Um, and, you know, it's interesting. My father uh, very often told me, he said, just try to be invisible. Right. Which probably was good, was very good advice. Um, but, you know, of course, you're six or seven years old and you stand there for two and a half hours and, and truly people would just collapse and die to the right and left of you. And then also, um, you never know, you know, from day to day, you never knew whether the person who was in charge of Appel was a ruthless killer who just wanted to pick out a few more people and send them to their death or someone who was a little bit more benign. So that was very frightening. In the beginning of Bergen-Belsen, actually, before it was totally uh, unlivable and overcrowded, there was a little, uh, you know, nursery for children, for children um, our age. And someone wrote us a letter after the war saying that my brother and I each had a toy. I think you had a little truck and I had an animal. Um, but the rest of the day, because our parents weren't around, you know, it was just kind of uh, hanging out there. We were almost alone in these empty barracks, except for people who were too sick, uh, who were dying. Uh, I mean, one of the you dramatic know, things about know, daily schedule people. The old people um, looked after the kids. Yeah, is when it was time to go to sleep because, as my brother said, as the as the camp became more crowded um, and you had these very narrow beds, it used to be two people in a bed, which already is impossible, but then it was three. And my brother and I were always um, the most popular bedmates because we were so t skinny and and small. So everybody wanted to sleep with us because we didn't take any room. And so uh, I remember I was always crying because of course, most of all, I wanted to sleep with uh, my mother or sleep with my brother. But, you know, that wasn't always the case because, you know, we were just kind of handed out. Um, so basically uh, it was a really frightening world, but to some degree, those were my first memories, you know, six and seven. I don't really remember that much before the war. I remember very much the day that we were picked up. So to some degree, these were my early memories. So I think you almost felt like there was no life that you had before. Do we have time to talk about food? Please. Yeah, do we have time to talk about the food in the camp? The daily... I'm, yeah, I'm going to sign off in about 10 minutes. Yeah, just, uh, you, you can just click leave. And thank you for joining us. Uh, the, uh, the rations that people were fed were equivalent to about 600 calories. A normal human being requires about 2,000 calories so to, re to remain healthy, um, among other things. And after Pell, I said, the Jews were able to work, had to go to work groups, but at some point, uh, came lunch when they 
all relative words, uh, which came out, and I, I didn't even tell my sister this, for years I've been, they came out and the, the food that uh, was turnips, they were called kohlrabis, which actually still exist. Uh, they were sort of turnips. And, and people became uh, concentration camps smart because the, the, the Nazis had a lot of horses. They actually, they, the Nazi army ran on horses for much of the war. I mean, they, they dragged trucks and howitzers and all, uh, tens and hundreds of thousands of horses. And horses would die. And when the horses died, they would chop them up and throw them in, into, into the garbage cans in which the food was delivered. And, the, the, and these were large corrugated garbage cans. And they were, for, I remember the name, they were called gamelan. And I was telling my sister, for years I've tried, been trying to look up the word gamelan. And two days ago, I said, I'm gonna try it again. And I, and I found a German, a German website that's sold gamelan, which are large pails of garbage cans, steel pails. After all this time, I found the gamelan were. Uh, and they were corrugated, and you and if you, they would throw a dead horse in into these garbage cans uh, of kohlrabi soup, and people would want to be in the middle of the line because if you were at the front of the line, you would get the top slop, which had no nutritional value. Uh, if you were at the back of the line, you could have misjudged it, and there would be no food, and you and you missed you missed whatever slop you were going to get. But if you were in the middle of the line, you had a good chance. Of getting some horse meat, so people and they, and if you lost your everybody had a tin cu a tin cup that was, that was you kept it around your waist on a string or a cloth belt. If you lost that, if you couldn't replace it, you were dead because the the, the food was this called rabbi soup, this horrible tasting so, to, uh, tasting stuff. And I re remember the there were children in Bergen Belsen. The, the average life for a child was maybe ten weeks. Uh, but there were children there, and my sister and I, uh, something you never forget, the, these gamelan, these garbage cans of food, were corrugated, you know, to give them strength. And I remember that, I don't know if you can see this, I would take my, I weighed 40 pounds, and my father weighed 90, 90 pounds, so so much for, you know, for being uh, privileged Jews. Anyway, you, we would take our fingers like this, cook them, and, and, and run them up and down the corrugation and then lick what was left of the soup on our fingers. And, and uh, on our birthday in January 14th, 1945, if you want to send me a card, my mother bought it or, or sold the last precious thing she had, which was a wedding band. She managed to keep it for two slices of bread and sprinkles. Uh, so just were they chocolate sprinkles or colored sprinkles? Merci. No, no, I they're think they were chocolate sprinkles. Yeah, it, chocolate it's sprinkles. a delicacy that Dutch children love yeah. to eat. Um, uh, uh, buttered bread with sprinkles. And they're called merci, little mice. Uh, and th this was such a big treat, the, you know, the piece of bread. Uh, that was, a, that, that was our, uh, our birthday present. If you have any more questions, again, I don't want to monopolize the whole evening. Can I um, ask, uh, do you know, this is from someone else, um, do you know anything about what happened to the rest of your family, like um, your grandparents? Oh, sure. Yes, my, my grandparents are grandparents. On my father's side, my father got them on the last boat. Uh, I have somewhere here in this mess, I have the receipt still. I'm, I'm busy writing memoirs. Uh, he got them on the last boat out of Lisbon. Portugal to America, paid plenty, even 1,400, 1400 US dollars of fortune in those, in those days. Uh, uh, so they got here. My father's sister uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, brother-in-law uh, also came to America through the offices of my father uh, and his generosity. Again, my father thought he, he, could, he couldn't, for, he, he had so much to leave that he, he thought he was safe. I mean, you know, in hindsight, you could say, hey dad, why didn't we go? But we didn't. Uh, and on my mother's side, my uh, grandmother who met us only once and only, I know, only know that because 
we were the, we were the size of your baby Lauren, uh, and uh, we have a picture of the, of my grand. Uh, grand she uh, she was was in several concentration camps, uh, and uh, and died in March 1945 in Stutthof, uh, in a woman's camp. And it was interesting. There's so, there's so many interesting things. After the war, everybody was trying to find each other. The Red Cross tried its best, but the newspapers were filled with ads. Little little, I've got it here somewhere. A little square ads. Does anybody? They also the same thing. Does anybody uh, know? Uh, uh, just what, 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 what was my Hirschberg? Yeah, no, no, her first name. Uh, Fanny. Fanny. The, 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 does, does anybody uh, know anything about Fanny Hirschberg from Recklinghausen, uh, born whatever, 19, whenever, 18, whatever? Uh, and uh, uh, my mother eventually found out that she was murdered in Stutthof with a machine gun, most of the prisoners, after, after this. We don't know whether that's what happened with her, but uh, my mother's father who, who was the head of the jew who, who was uh, uh, seriously involved with the jewish community in recklinghausen the small he was a successful merchant uh he refused my father had had arranged for an apartment for them in holland but they he refused to leave the community although the rabbi who i met in rochester had no had no reluctance to get to, to get, get get out of germany but but my grandfather would, did not want to abandon the Jewish community uh, and uh, stayed in Germany. And my mother was walking on the street one day. Uh, this was before we were, uh, I think it was before we were sent to the camp. I'm not sure, could have been, but anyway, somebody, uh, uh, my mother said that, that her parents were always hoping there'd be a knock on the door and that my, my, my mother would be there. But my, my mother was walking on the street, I have it in my father's memoirs, and said to her, Ilsa, I'm so sorry to hear. My mother said, what? It's about your father. Uh, he'd had a heart attack. Uh, yeah, it was before the war. Uh, as, after Kristallnacht in 1938. Uh, uh, and uh, he, was, he was a young man in his 50s. Uh, and he had a heart attack, killed over and died uh, from the stress of, of the Nazi regime. So they died. Uh, most. Most of our, uh, so, uh, some family got to Sweden, uh, some fa family got to Israel, uh, a lot of cousins and extended family were all perished. But uh, I must say, unlike the, the typical survivor, uh, our family was not wiped out. I mean, there were enough people who were, who were killed, but a, a lot of our family survived. Except on my mother's side. Yes. Uh, I have to leave, but it was such a pleasure meeting you. Yes, thank you for joining us. Okay. Bye -bye. Thank you so much. Um, we, we have this recorded, so um, I know that your son is here too, and um, we'll uh, have a, a YouTube link for you. So um, okay. you, can, you can keep this, and um, we will certainly make sure it makes it into our icon. Our icon can you can you unmute everybody? I want to see if my son is still there. I don't, I don't see him. I think I see him. If his name is David and he looks yes. a lot, he's I'm, here. I'm here, Dad. Hi. At all? Hi, son. Good to see you, and thank <laughs> this you. This is the only way. This is the only way we get to see each other. This is very nice. Yes, uh, th th that th that that is my my youngest son. I have three sons and and a daughter. Uh, he lives in New York City, and and, and he is a Wall Street person. And, but right now he, he doesn't like to do that. But right now he's in Connecticut at their uh, summer home, hiding from the hell that's New York right now with uh, his three children. Uh, two wonderful. I was, I was I was thinking you need to you need Wonder? to update you need to update your nine eleven analogy. This one is probably a better one. <laughs> Which was that? About about, huh? about about the Holocaust needing to well, be imagined. Yeah, I, I, I was tempted, except no, no one is purposely trying to, trying to kill us. But good to see you, son. And he's there with his wife, Diane, and uh, uh, three children. And uh, you've been there how long now? Five weeks? Or two months? Something like, something like that. Yeah. <laughs>
all, no, work, working from home. Th David, thank you for joining us. Is, is Maul going to bed? Can I ask one last question? Yes. And I know that there were a lot of questions, you know, how did, how did you, well, two last questions. One is, um, what brought you to Rochester? Uh, I, I, uh, after college, I was a Navy officer for four years. My father insisted uh, that we repay this country. And so he volunteered me and I had four great years as a Navy officer. And then I got into my, my if, if I have any talents, it's writing. Uh, and I worked for the New York Times for a short time, but that was too much of an apprenticeship and uh, uh, ended up in the photographic business and uh, worked for uh, David's grandfather, uh, who, was, who was also, a, who came here before the, for, before the war, but who was an incredibly successful uh, marketer and, uh, in the photographic business. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the, one of the uh, product lines that uh, this company, it's, it's long gone, represented was made in Rochester and these people want to sell the business. Uh, and I managed to uh, come up here by a very small business with five people that grew to a, this is 1976, uh, and which, which grew to uh, a business with 90 people. And I sold it in uh, 1998 and I thought I was going to retire. And, uh, but I, thought I got another career. So I just retired last year. So that was Rochester. The, 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 uh, a, a business brought me up here. I, I always swore I would leave as soon as I could, but I'm still here. Um, and then finally, um, someone, the asked, someone asked, um, I can't reach the screen right now, but someone asked um, something. If you could explain how you survived this emotionally. If you could share a little bit about how you have come to be in the place that you are today. Well, uh, the best way to answer that is my wife is a psychiatrist and I should have had one a long time ago. Uh, I am, um, you know, I, with, what, what, what the biggest luck we had in some ways that, that my sister and I were young, that we, we, we felt the physical torture, the, the constant hunger, the constant, when we, we used to sit on the ground and pick lice out of each other's head, but we didn't, we didn't understand what lice really meant, uh, ty typhus. And I saw, to this day, I remember the cracking sound. Uh, when you, if you take a, a, well, I guess any in, insect and you, and you squeeze it between your dirty nails and they crack and because they itch and my sister and I would just be taking lice out of a, uh, but the, I mean, the, the positive was that, that we were too young for context and to really realize that we were sentenced to death and that, and, and that, we, that we were at the edge of death every, every day for, uh, for a, a, a year and a half. We were spared that. Uh, we were not spared the suffering. I mean, we, so I, I weighed 40 pounds, my father weighed about 90 pounds. Uh, so, uh, but I, I've always wondered, I've, I've asked my wife, I guess was a psychiatrist, how screwed up am I? And she, and she says, you're not my patient. Uh, but she'll, sm she'll smile. Uh, I, rem I remember the morning uh, of after 9-11, this was interesting, it was insightful. We had just moved from Canandaigua uh, to our present uh, house and on the water and I'm, and my family, some of my family uh, like to go shooting. Uh, uh, and I, I, I had a collection of, of, of handguns. And it was the day after 9-11, my, my wife went to work, uh, again, as a, a physician. And I was watching television like everybody who was old enough was just mesmerized. And I was filled with fright that this would happen again. And I took out all these guns I had and I put them on the living room floor with, with, with my eyes glued to the TV, cleaning guns. And my wife came home after work and she said, what are you doing? And I said, cleaning guns. She doesn't have a problem with that. And, and, 
And she said, why? And I said, well, the way it was moved, the, the, the ought to be clean. And she just looked at me and she said, uh-huh. You know, so I can't answer the question. I, 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 I know that, some, that probably a lot of my craziness, we all have it, but whatever craziness I have, I'm a bit of a loner. I don't like, I hate travel. Uh, I'm apprehensive. Uh, you know, I never played ball because my father never played ball. I had a hard time growing up because I was an American in the sense that, that to me, a quarterback is a tax refund. I still, I've never played a sport, a sport in my life. I've never watched a sport. So it was a weird upbringing, uh, but I'm here. My, my son, David, did a lot better. His kids are great athletes. Uh, he plays tennis and what are the sports, all sorts of stuff. He's, he's the all American. It takes a generation or two. Well, I was actually going to say, Dad, more interestingly, I know, uh, well, that um, Marion ended up the mirror image of you. She is the You mean totally, total opposite? Yes. You're, you're absolutely correct. She's a total opposite of me. Hi, Diane. Uh, you, right. Which, and for example, I'm, I, I have a real bad eating habit. I only, I only eat about... Uh, half a dozen things, uh, always the same stuff. Uh, my wife always has to make me a separate meal. Uh, and I think, I think it's, it's, it's one of the things that, that, that even my mother indulged after the camp, I just couldn't eat, I couldn't eat anything that looked like meat. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, my sister is a, is a gourmet and has no eating issues. She's a world traveler and I just want to be home. So we're, yes, you're right, we're, we're mirror, mirror images. We're quite opposite, but also we get along very well, uh, especially in, in the last 20 years. So as, as different as we are. Do you want to call it quits or do you have any more? No, I was going to mention that you were supposed to be um, on a trip right now. We were supposed uh, to go to Holland tomorrow uh, uh, for, the, for the 75th anniversary of the liberation. And my sister had this whole thing planned and and everybody had their first class tickets paid for and and she she was working on it for over a year and and she, she I didn't want to go and because of my proclivities uh but I, I I got guilted into it uh so we was all set to go and then the pandemic hit and she kept I said Marion if this isn't going to happen and she kept delaying 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 and then finally because you know my age and uh some few health issues. I said, I can't go. I can't. I, I can't risk my health. So finally, literally at the last second, uh, it was canceled. It was going to be a, a five day uh, trip with a concert. Uh, I guess my sister's gone. Uh, there's an organization called uh, the Defiant Requiem uh, uh, Foundation in Washington D.C. Uh, in the Camp Theresienstadt. Uh, they had an orchestra and they had a conductor, uh, and they, they had one score of the Verdi Requiem, uh, and they would play this again and again, and to the, the Germans, including the Nazis, the Nazis love music, and they would sit there too. Uh, but the Nazis would constantly call out the orchestra and send, you know, send a third of them to Auschwitz to be gassed. So each time this conductor, and just his name escapes me, uh, 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 we would have to find new prisoners who could play the violin and viola and sharing one score. Uh, and, and he was finally sent to Auschwitz and he died uh, there too. Uh, but this, uh, uh, the, in Washington is this foundation based, based on, and, and they give this concert uh, all over the world has been given in the US three or four times based on this, uh, on the Verdi Requiem as it was played uh, in Theresienstadt, and, and that was going to be the, the centerpiece of our trip uh, to Holland, uh, and obviously it didn't happen. So, somebody um, earlier in the chat uh, posted. What's baby? He's very good um, right now. Um, <laughs> somebody posted that they found you and your sister's story on a website. Um, I don't know if they just wrote that to me. Hang on, let me pull my... I, th I think th uh, th uh, that th the Defined Requiem uh, has a very extensive uh, website. And if you 
anyone's interested, it's defiantrequiem.org. Uh, th 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 they did a featured story. My sister is uh, is uh, on uh, on the board, and uh, her, her uh, significant other uh, today's yard side of her late husband. So if I remember that, uh, her, uh, is the chairman of it, uh, and 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 they and they they did our story. So if, if you're curious, you can. You go to defiantrequiem.org and it's, it, it's in there. And again, if somebody wants to really go into the weeds, as we say, and uh, send me an email with you uh, and I will send you a PDF of my father's memoirs. I'm very careful. I was a history major, not, not a great student, but a history major. Uh, and I, I have a high regard for that. This, this entire story, this history has to be accurate and I've heard way too often people who are winging it or I, I think they remember and and uh, I never did that, but I, and maybe, maybe this is a good ending. Uh, we, we were five, six and seven, so how much do you remember? I remember the physical, I don't remember what, you know, names and stuff, And but I would have memories in the middle of the night and I would call my mother the next day, some, sometimes I take notes and I would call my mother, the, uh, the next day, and I'd say, Mom, I was thinking, I, I, I even can't even say dreams. They were thoughts, they weren't nightmares. Uh, I'd say, Mom, I remember that Zeus, my sister, Zeus and I uh, lying in a field on a blanket with two suitcases. Uh, what was that all about? And she said, oh, we, we were, had just been arrested by the Nazis in Holland, and, and uh, we had some luggage, two suitcases, and we were taken onto a field, and it was cold in the middle of the night, and I put a blanket down it, uh, and I put the two suitcases on each side to act as a windbreak. So she gave the whole thing context. And then often I would say, mom, I had this memory of, of so-and-so, and she, again, she had, had this great German accent. She would say, Stephen, I don't remember this at all. And I would hit the delete button because if she didn't remember it, it was in my imagination. Uh, and. The third option was, I would say, mom, I remember this and this and that and that. And she would say, ah, yeah, but, and that, I, that my memory was pretty good, but it wasn't a hundred percent. And I would say, tell me more. So it, whenever I do talk about it, uh, it's either in my father's memoir or later from our own, own memories. Or uh, the interesting thing, my sister and I never spoke about it, which is very typical for Holocaust survivors, not, not that there were many left, but years and years ago, maybe 30 or 40 years ago, I lived in, well, I lived in Rochester, my sister was in Washington, and we were invited by Yale University to give an oral testimony. My sister and I had never discussed it, and in those days, my passion was flying, and I, had a, I owned a small airplane, so I flew from Rochester to Yale, in the Connecticut, uh, and uh, I was in a sound booth behind glass uh, and I had arrived before my sister so I was giving my memory and then I saw my sister behind the glass of the, the studio just sitting there and then when I was finished I got out and I and I sat on the other side of the booth and our memories were 80% the same which is which which was sort of pleasing that we that, you know that that we were careful with what we remembered uh, and and so I, I have no problem in looking up the facts because I don't trust memory, especially at, at 82. Um, I just, I, I want to say... Um, I'm fine, so I'm in no rush. I don't know Mary, but um, on my screen, Mary is right next to you, and um, Mary wrote into the chat um, that as an older Holocaust survivor herself, she wanted to thank you um, for making sure that you never forget. So um, I think this has been an incredible experience all around, but um, Mary, uh, thank you um, for being here um, as well. Thank you. Thank, and thank you all for, for your time and attention. And thank you, son. I know. I was very busy. I had to chat with, with this kid. Um, <clears throat> and um, we just wanna say, to Stephen, and please um, pass along to Marion our most heartfelt thank you um, for letting us witness 
um, your story. Um, we, we have to do this all the time and your resilience is overwhelming and it gives me great hope and seeing your beautiful family um, is incredible. Um, and that's a tweet for me too. Uh, um, you know how they say next year in Jerusalem, next year in Ithaca. Yes. In <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. um, Once you this. You know, the one, the one um, thing, silver lining here is that we have this amazing recording uh, now. And so um, for those of you who um, are not on our email list or are not in touch, um, please follow us on Facebook. We're going to post this um, video um, in a few hours, probably, maybe tomorrow. It depends on how long it takes um, to load. Um, and we will share this with you if you want to email us and request a copy of this um, video. We'll email it to you if you email us at um, hillel at ithaca.edu. Um, but Stephen, it's just so, so wonderful to be with you again. And um, thank you. Thank you so you know, much. It's interesting you say that because my sister uh, wrote an op-ed. I mean, you can't, you can't, uh, compare COVID-19 with the uh, concentration camp, but, she, but her focus was, was the heroism of some people, of many people, the frontline people in the pandemic and heroism in the camps of, of which it was. Uh, and this was published in the LA Times last week and it was picked up by the Associated Press. So it was, it was syndicated. And I'm, I'm, I'm a cynic and I'm a realist and I was, shocked by the number of anti-Semitic comments on the, actually it was on the, on the Yahoo uh, web, uh, the, the Yahoo platform uh, to the point, you know, enough of the Holocaust, enough of the Jews. Anti-Semitism anti is alive and well. And it's, it's, there was a time when it disappeared after the war because, you know, the, the guilt was all over the place. Uh, and then the Eichmann trial in '65, uh, but it it's it's it, it it just keeps coming back. So it it is important that that it be remembered. Oh, and again, thank you all. Are we closing? Thank you, Stephen. I think um, we will. As my daughter is uh, going going to the potty, um, <laughs> and, um, we. Um, we hope next year in person, next year in Ithaca, and we just um, are so blessed by you sharing your story with us tonight. Well, so thank, thank you, and thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Or, or disinviting me and then inviting me again. So, <laughs> this is a, a lot easier. David, will you phone me at later? I will do. You Good can night, everyone. <laughs>